your host and teacher, Perry Stone. Many people will tell you that the coming of Jesus Christ in the form of the rapture, the English word that we use to describe the event of Jesus catching away the living saints, is not found anywhere in the Old Testament. It's just a doctrine that came along in the 1830s at an Irvin Guide prayer meeting. How many times have I heard that theory propagated? But today on Manifest, I am going to share with you in detail Old Testament scriptures that absolutely reveal a catching away prior to the day that God's wrath is poured out on the earth. Now, let's get started immediately. We know that if we read the book of Revelation, that the time of God's wrath is the time called Great Tribulation. Now, the tribulation is not a theory that somebody came up with just to try to scare people. The tribulation is mentioned as a time of Jacob's trouble in the book of Jeremiah. Isaiah 4, uh, chapter 13 talks about the cosmic activity that will happen, how the nations will be shaken. In fact, the prophets of the Old Testament deal quite extensively with what we call the time of the end and the last days, and they see a lot of terrible judgments happening to the earth, including famines and pestilence and earthquakes. Jesus warned about this in Matthew chapter 24, and he also mentioned the word, "...then shall be great tribulation." Revelation chapter 7 said, These are they which have come out of great tribulation or tribulation the great. So my point is that there is coming a time of tribulation. And that time of tribulation is identified in Daniel 9.27 as one week. Now that word week in Hebrew in Daniel 9.27 is not a week of days. It's a Hebrew word for a week of years. In other words, a seven-year time frame. In the book of Revelation from chapter 4 to chapter 19... I'm a futurist. I believe the book of Revelation deals with future prophecies. Then that time frame is divided up into 42 months and 42 months. And, and the Bible says in the midst of the seven or in the midst of the seven years, the Antichrist breaks the treaty. You'll find that in Revelation chapter 11, 12, and 13. After the Antichrist kills the two witnesses, he then goes into Jerusalem with the false prophet, sets himself up as God, builds the image of the beast, the icon, which is the Greek word used in Revelation chapter 13, uh, that speaks and lives and deceives multitudes, okay? Now, having said that, if we go back to the Old Testament, let me go back very quickly and, and share with you, uh, once again, uh, Zephaniah chapter 1, 18, also 2, 1. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by, fire, by the fire of his jealousy. He will make speedily riddance of all those who dwell in the land. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather together, O undesirable nation, before the decree is issued, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you. Now, we talked about last week's program, how that if you look at this, that before the decree is issued, God is asking his people to be gathered together. Uh, and he talks about this undesirable nation. Now, some would say that alludes to the nation of Israel, but in prophecy, this is a future prophecy. In prophecy, uh, the Bible says that the church is a holy nation, a chosen generation, and a royal priesthood. So we as a church are called a holy nation. Number two, in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, chapter 32 and also verse 21, it says that there will be a nation that God is going to raise up that would provoke Israel to jealousy. Now, that nation was not the United States. That nation was the church, which is the holy nation. Also, in the, uh, in the parable that Jesus gave, which is found in Matthew's gospel, I believe it's Matthew chapter 21, he talks about how that there was a vineyard and how the Lord would lend out the vineyard to another nation that would bring forth fruit to the Lord in its season. The other nation there, again, is the church, which was raised up to bring forth spiritual fruit for the kingdom of God. So, this undesirable nation can allude to the church, which is the holy nation, which is gathered together before the Lord's fierce anger and gathered together before the time of the Lord's wrath. Now, that would indicate to me it's what some call a pre-wrath catching away. And someone says, well, the wrath of God is the middle of the tribulation toward the end. Well, in chapter 6 of Revelation, it talks about the wrath of the Lamb in the breaking of the first six seals of that seven-sealed book that the Lamb opens in chapter 5 of Revelation. Later on in the book of Revelation, however, it talks about the wrath of God. It appears to me, and I'm not trying to be picky about this, but it appears to me that the first 42 months is called wrath of the Lamb, 
and the last 42 months called the wrath of God. And so uh, we don't, we don't, I'm not going to get into all the theology of that because I don't want to be sidetracked from the subject. Now, looking back at this, if you read Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 3, look what it says. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth. Remember, the meek shall inherit the earth, which have brought his, judge, wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. Now, notice this. This is very important. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. Wow. This verse talking about the Lord's anger speaks that the meek are going to be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. Now, Jesus said it this way. Pray that you be accounted worthy to escape all these things which are coming to pass on the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, this idea of hiding in the day of the Lord's anger, being hidden away, protected, from the wrath or the anger of the Lord. Look at Psalms 27 and 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up on a rock. Now, this concept of being hidden in the day of the Lord, in the day of the Lord's anger, is also found in Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. Here's the second Old Testament scripture that we want to use indicating protection from God's wrath and indignation for the righteous. Here's what it says. Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing ye that dwell on the dust, for the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou in thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth shall also disclose her blood. Now stop right there and remember, in the book of Revelation, the martyrs in chapter 6 are saying, How long, O God, will you not avenge our blood of them that dwell on the earth? The earth shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. In fact, in the book of Revelation, Babylon, mystery Babylon is destroyed because it shed the blood of the prophets and of the saints. So in the book of Revelation, really a lot of these judgments that are taking place, if you study the book carefully, are there because of the shedding of righteous blood, which has happened literally from the time that Cain killed Abel, you know, over the past almost 6,000 years or longer. Now let's go back to this Isaiah scripture. Number one, the prophet said that I will be raised along with all of the other dead. So this deals with the resurrection. Now, when is the next resurrection plan? Jesus was raised from the dead as the first fruits of the dead. But the next resurrection is the dead in Christ who shall rise first, according to the apostle Paul. So those who are dead, their soul and spirit is in paradise in the third heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul wrote that when Jesus comes, he will bring them with him. That means he brings their soul and spirit out of the paradise compartment, and then they have a resurrection. It's a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised. All right? So there's the resurrection. So he says, Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. They shall arise. Arise you that sing in the dust, because the earth shall cast out her dead. This is the resurrection of the righteous. Now watch what happens. Number two, he says, Now come, my people, and enter thou into thy chamber and shut the door. Now the word door here is very interesting. Because if you will go to the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew's gospel, you will discover that five were wise and five were foolish. And the five that were wise had additional oil because the bridegroom delayed his coming. And the five that were unwise ran out of oil and they were told to go buy oil. As they are out buying oil, then the bridegroom comes secretly and suddenly and takes the five wise virgins with him. And it says they entered into the chamber and the door was shut. Now, if we go to the book of Revelation and we believe that chapter 4 through chapter 19 deals with the tribulation period... Chapters 2 and 3 deal with the seven churches of Asia or the seven time frames and time periods of the dispensation of the church age. After that, John says, he hears a voice saying, come up hither, and immediately he is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. There's a transition from Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the church, to chapter 4, which is the scene of the temple in heaven. Now, he says, I saw a door 
in heaven open. Now that word door is a Greek word that means a literal portal or opening, opening meaning John wasn't just using some kind of symbolic, symbolic allegory to describe. No, no, no. He saw a door. He saw an opening and he was caught up into that opening. Now, once you pass through the door, then the door is shut. That's why you have in the parable of the five wise virgins, they enter into the bridal chamber and the door is shut. So watch this. Enter into your chambers and shut the doors about thee. Now, why are you entering into your chamber? your secret place, and shutting the door about thee for a little moment till the indignation be passed. Now, indignation is a word that is used, uh, Daniel eleven thirty six, representing the indignation of God or the wrath of God or the judgments of God that are going to be poured out on the earth. And he said, hide yourself for a little moment, meaning that this isn't going to last forever. It's for a time period. And if you'll read the Bible, the seven vials, seven trumpets, and the, uh, the seven seal book, Six seals, six trumpets, and six vials totally deal with judgment striking the earth. And so we see that this indignation only lasts for a moment. Then what happens? The Lord returns. And it says God is going to come out of his place to punish the earth for shedding the innocent blood. And you will find that in Revelation 6 when the martyrs say, How long, O God, will you not avenge us of our blood of those that dwell on the earth? Revelation 20, souls are beheaded for the testimony which they hold. And Mystery Babylon is judged because she shed the blood of Christ and the blood of the saints and the prophets. So the judgments of the indignation God will send in the tribulation are based on more than anything else. This is important you understand this, shedding innocent blood. Look at 50 million babies aborted in America. And now we want to know why we're having land problems with water pipes busting in one city with 2 million people out of drinking water. Water on the coast getting polluted by oil. Someone says, oh, come on, Perry, this is all natural stuff. Let me tell you, without going into detail, many of the judgments that the angels pour out in the book of Revelation, the six trumpets and the six vials that are poured out, many of them can be equated to an asteroid, and there will be an asteroid strike the earth in the book of Revelation, volcanic eruptions, which the ash will cover the sky and darken the sun, and tsunamis. Those three things people will look at and think it's a natural disaster, but the earth, the Bible said, is groaning and travailing under the weight of the shed blood and the weight of sin. And so the Lord spoke to me. I, I, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but this was years and years ago, and I began to tell some partners. The Lord spoke to me and said, when America gets near the level of 50 million aborted babies, God said, I'm going to allow the hedge to come down on parts of the United States, and they're going to see a lot of difficulty that they've never seen before. So what's sad is the politicians of America and even our Supreme Court does not understand the Bible. You cannot shed innocent blood. And so the innocent blood of righteous people, and I believe even children, if you read Matthew 23, Jesus said that Jerusalem would be destroyed because of the blood shed from, from Abel to Zechariah, whom they slew between the porch and the altar. So in this time of indignation in the book of Revelation, especially the tribulation, it's about blood being shed in the earth and the blood crying up to God for vengeance. And that's why the earth shakes, the earth quakes, and the terrible things happen because Paul said the earth is in travail waiting to be delivered. So when you read, let me say this, when you read again Isaiah chapter 26, verses 19 through verse 21, it absolutely tells you that when the dead are raised, that the righteous are going to go into a chamber and be hidden until the indignation be passed. So if the tribulation is seven years in length, first uh, 42 months is the wrath of the Lamb, last 42 months is called the wrath of God, then we can understand that the righteous have to be in heaven. Jesus said, where I am, there you may be also. So the righteous have to be in heaven with the Lord, protected during this time of indignation. Now here again, we're dealing with the catching away of the saints and the resurrection of the dead in Christ in a, uh, a concept that the English theological word is rapture. Last week, we talked about the history of that word. We talked about you can use the phrase gathering together, caught up together, the phrase general assembly from Hebrews 12, and also the phrase translation of the saints. Use any of those phrases if you're uncomfortable with the word rapture. It's simply a theological word used to describe the event. Now, I want to go back over three verses here. And 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17 says we're going to be caught up. That's what happens to the living the moment Christ returns. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 says we are gathered together. That's when the living and the dead meet together in the air 
and we immediately go into the heavens. And then Hebrews chapter 12 and 23, I love this, talks about the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, and that is where we meet in heaven. So you got three things here I want you to understand. One is the saints being changed and caught up to heaven. The second term means the living in saints meeting together in heaven, in the air. And the third term is the living saints and the, and the dead saints and the angels meeting together in the temple of heaven at the great assembly or the general assembly. So any of these terms or phrases can be used to describe what we use as the English word rapture. All right. Now, let me let me talk to you for a moment because I want I want to go ahead and share this with you again. When you begin to talk about the rapture of the church, and again, I use the term, I could use gathering together or catching away, but there'd be thousands of people list, watching me saying, what does it mean by gathering together and catching away? The word rapture has been an established theological word to describe the event that occurs in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 through 17, Ephesians 1 and 10, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1, and so forth. Now, here's the argument that you hear. And I get letters on this. The rapture is a false teaching. The rapture is heretical doctrine. And I have sat down with people from time to time who taught that, and I would share with them what I'm getting ready to share with you next week. And they looked at me and said, I've never heard anything like this. Nobody ever taught me this, Brother Perry. I always believed that it was heresy from this book that was written. I won't name the man's book, where he traced it back to the 1830s or a preacher on television that's very well known who says he doesn't believe in it. He thinks it's a modern fabricated doctrine. Now, remember this. For someone to say the rapture is a false doctrine is the same thing that the Roman church said about Martin Luther when he preached the just shall live by faith. It's the same thing that mainline denominations said when the outpouring of the Spirit hit at Azusa Street. They said it was a heresy and a demonic doctrine. It's the same thing that denominationalism said about the great healing revival from 1948 to 1955 when my father, who came out of that era, saw men pray for people in tents. Uh, they were in, men in tents pray for people. Let me rephrase that. And gorders would fall off of people. Deaf ears would be unopened. Blind eyes would, uh, uh, would be opened. And uh, great miracles would happen. It's the same thing that classical Pentecostals began to say about the blessing teaching that the Charismatics brought in the 1980s. I can remember sitting under ministers. That's heresy. And now these classical Pentecostal churches, some of them are having terrible financial difficulty. And I told one the other day, I said, the reason you're having difficulty is I heard you preach for 30 years that God doesn't prosper people. Now, how can you expect to have the blessing of God when you're not telling people God will bless them for their giving? And I'm not trying to rebuke anyone here. I'm simply making an observation. Well, now the preterists and other organizations are telling us that we don't know what we're teaching. We're teaching heresy. We're teaching false doctrine because we're teaching about a rapture of the church. And I will just simply say to you that there is a reason why this teaching resurfaced when it did. How often have I heard somebody say, well, it was in the 1800s that the teaching of the coming of the Lord resurfaced. Well, duh, there's a reason that it resurfaced in the 1800s. Are you ready for this? Why from the fourth century all the way to the 1800s, Matthew Henry, Adam Clark, James Fawcett and Brown. Why are these men who wrote these great commentaries don't do a lot of teaching on the coming of the Lord? You want the answer? Here's the answer. Because in the prophecies of the Bible, there's a man called the Antichrist that has to come to Israel and the Jewish people have to be living in Israel at the time the Antichrist comes and the Jewish people have to flee out of the city of Jerusalem and the Jewish people have to be in control of Israel and in control of the city of Jerusalem for the prophecies to begin to come to pass. And from the 4th century to the 1800s, there was no nation of Israel. There were no Jewish people controlling the nation of Israel. There was no reestablishment of the Jews returning from the nations of the earth. There was no city of Jerusalem. It was under Turkish occupation. The Turks had it from 1517 to 1917. Now, you pray tell me how is anybody supposed to get up and preach the coming of Jesus Christ for the saints and the resurrection of the dead when the coming of the Messiah for the saints and the resurrection of the dead are linked to Israel being a nation, Jerusalem being the capital, the Jews returning from around the world, the land of Israel blossoming like a rose, 
and the nations surrounding Israel being her enemies wanting to destroy her. That's what the prophecies teach about the time of the end. Now, how could any early father from the 4th century, when Jerusalem had been destroyed in 70 A.D., the Jews had been scattered, the Roman occupied the city of Jerusalem, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Muslims, the Marmelukes, the Turks, the British, the Jewish people had no control or access over their own destiny or city till 1948 after the Holocaust of seven years. So my point is this, this argument of, well, I don't find anywhere where people for hundreds and hundreds of years taught on the rapture of the church. Well, they didn't teach it, folks, because there was no prophecies being fulfilled in their time to prove the Lord was coming back. So what did they teach? They basically taught Jesus coming to set up his kingdom on earth, or number two, they taught the church was to set up the kingdom on earth. That's what Augustine taught. St. Augustine taught that the church was going to set up a rule for a thousand years on earth. And the Roman Catholic Church for approximately a thousand years attempted that. The Byzantine branch of the Christian church, which was the eastern branch, attempted that for a thousand years, and it got interrupted and disrupted by... Islam in the 1400s and 1500s, and that disrupted the whole plan. So my point is the reason we see this teaching restored in the 18, 1900s, and now the 21st century, the prophecies related to the return of the Messiah are now being fulfilled. Whoa, that's a lot to say. Now, I'm not through with this series. I tell you, I was only going to go three weeks with this, but I got to pick this thing up and go a little bit further because I still haven't got to some of the deep teaching I want to get to so next week, we're going to plow even deeper, explaining the reason for the rapture, the escaping the time of trouble. I have a very stone. Well, it's another manifest program today coming to you from the city of Jerusalem. Now, I want you to stay with me. If you've never stayed with an entire manifest telecast, I'm going to give you two. Actually, it's, it's more than two, but two revelations that in my lifetime of preaching 34 years, I did not know till two weeks ago. Yeah, now think about that. Now, I want to ask you a question. What does it mean to be on the right hand of God or on the left hand of God? A lot of people may not know how to answer that. If you will go to the scripture, we're going to go to the book of Job in a moment. Job said that he was living on the left hand of God where he does work, doth work. And if you go into, for example, the, the Jewish thought of the right and the left hand, you know, at, at creation, there was darkness and light created. And the Jewish concept was that light was on the right hand and, and the darkness was on the left hand. And then if you go into some of the concepts of the Ten Commandments, they talk about the ones where thou shall, which are positive, and thou shalt not, which are to some considered negative. And they say that the positive ones were created by the right hand, the negative one's on the left hand. Now, for all you left-handed folks out there, <laughs> has nothing to do with whether or not you're left-handed when you write or right-handed when you write. I thought I would go ahead and say that for my dad's a lefty, my brother's a lefty, all right? So it has no bearing on that whatsoever. But it's, it's, like, it's like looking at it and using sort of a metaphor to talk about the good and the bad. Job, we're going to go there now, and I'm going to show you some nuggets from the book of Job. And I'm going to show you something that, to me, really stirred me up. Earlier in my ministry, there was a movement that started called the Word of Faith Movement. Great movement. Many of my friends are in the Word of Faith Movement. But when they read the book of Job, they made Job a book that dealt strictly with confession. In other words, Job's confession may have gotten off or he didn't say the right thing. And that's why he went under the attack that he did. I'm going to show you in a few moments that the key of the book of Job has to do with blood and sacrifices not so much with confession. It is tied to confession, but let's just go there instead of talking about it. Okay, Job chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Uz, not a Oz, by the way, the land of Uz, Uz, which is believed to be uh, south, south of Edom in the land of Esau, in the land of the Gentiles, uh, perhaps somewhere in the Arabian Peninsula. And uh, the man was perfect and upright, feared God and shunned evil. Notice three things. He was upright. Number two, he feared God. Number three, shunned evil. There was born to him seven sons and three daughters, or a total of ten children. His substance was also 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very great household. And this man, now look at this phrase, was the greatest in the east. Now the east 
in the Bible always alludes to the land of Israel, what's east of it. So that would be in the territory you start thinking about it going toward India and Afghanistan and Pakistan and Persia and all those countries to the east. He was the greatest man out of all that territory. Now here's what happens. And, uh, it, it, and his sons went and feasted on their houses, every one in his day, and sent and called for the three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, now this is important, verse 5 is a key verse. It was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, Job sent and sanctified them, rose up early in the morning, offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. Ten children, that means he put ten offerings on the altar, one for every child. That it, it, because he said, it may be my sons have sinned and cursed God in their heart. This Job did continually. So here's what he's doing. He's building an altar, and he's putting ten individual sacrifices on that altar, one representing each child. Now here's a nugget for you. There was a day, not days, but a single day, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan, Hasatan, the adversary, came among them. And then you get this conversation between God and Satan concerning Job. Now, if you look at the conversation, God is bragging on Job, and Satan is accusing him of serving God for an ulterior motive. Are you ready for what I'm going to say? Never thought about this in 34 years of ministry. Why does it say there was a day when the sons of God came and Satan presented himself? Because in Jewish thought that goes all the way back to the time of Moses, there was a, uh, the, uh, the sixth moed or sixth appointed season of Israel is called Day of Atonement. On the Day of Atonement, it's the day when Satan makes accusations directly in the face of God against God's people. And so on this day, which would have been the Rosh Hashanah time frame, Satan is approaching the very throne of God to make an accusation against God's main man on earth at that time, who is Job himself. Now someone says, well, are you saying, did Moses write this book? Wouldn't Moses have been greater than Job? Certainly if Moses wrote it, but no one knows who wrote it. Did Job write it? Did Moses write it? Did one of the early scribes or one of the early prophets write that particular book? So that's one of the questions that people have about who wrote the book of Job. The point is that according to Hebraic thought, Rosh Hashanah, which is called the Day of Atonement, is the day when the adversary is permitted to accuse Israel in front of God. So there was a day when the sons of God came, and the sons of God is Bini Elohim, which are the angels, and they're coming before God, and they're accusing Job. Now here's what happens. I want you, I want to, pay, I want you to pay careful attention to this. All of a sudden, Satan says to God, if you will stretch forth your hand or put forth now your hand, touch all he has, Job will curse you to, his fa to, to your face. Now, when you read this in the English Bible, put forth your hand, we think it means that Satan is saying to God, take your hand and move it and hit Job with your hand. That's not what it means there. Now, watch what I'm going to, uh, going to do. Re if I were to say to someone, remove your hand, we know what that means. But if I were to say, stretch your hand forth, we think it means to go forward with it that way. Literally, what Satan is saying to God is, take your hand that's on him and move your hand, not on him, but away from him. See, as oh my. I have a friend of mine in Texas, Lamarck, Texas, Walter Hallam, that taught me this. He said, Perry... People, don't, people misunderstand what it means when we talk about the judgment of God because they think that God is in heaven just looking at something saying, I think I'll attack that, but I won't attack that. Well, that looks bad, so let me get that. See, the hand of God, as long as the hand of God is on you, the favor of God is on you. As long as the hand of God is on you, the blessing of God is on you. As long as the hand of God is on you, the enemy is not able to get in because it forms a protective hedge the way it did with Job. However, if God ever lifts his hand, that's when the hedge is removed and the enemy is able to come in even it could be natural disasters, it could be difficulties that come, attacks of satanic powers. So as long as the hand of God is on something, Satan can't get in it. But if the hand of God is lifted, he can get in. See, Satan knew there was a hedge around Job. The word hedge there is a very interesting word because it, it's like creating a barrier or creating a stronghold or a fortress around someone. Now, there's been debates for years as to what was the hedge that God put around Job. Some people said, well, it was a thorn bush. Well, listen, a thorn bush is not going to keep a devil out. You understand? A devil's a spirit. In the book of Psalms, it says, the angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear God and deliver them. And I believe that that encampment round about is what Job had. He had an encampment of angels round about his property, round about his family, round about him. And the enemy tried to get in and could not get in because the angels encamp around about those that do what? Say it. Fear the Lord.
And so what did Job do? He feared the Lord. So he fits the pattern of an individual that could have angelic protection. So in other words, God literally withdrew the angels of protection around his property, giving Satan permission to go in. Now here's what happens. Now stay with me because this, this is going to get very interesting here in a moment. Trust me. All of a sudden, the sub, sudden number one, verse 15, the Sabine, Sabines came in and uh, began to attack. All, and uh, then the fire of God, verse 16, uh, came and... Um, and destroyed the sheep. Verse uh, 17, number three, the Chaldeans came in in three bands, took the camels, carried them all away. Then the worst part that happened is verse 19, a wind came from the wilderness, smote the four corners of the house and fell upon the ten kids. Now I want you to imagine probably within a day of losing all ten children in your family, losing all the wealth that you had, no animal is left. Now you gotta, you've got to get this point. At that point of time there was no blood sacrifice. What Satan took from Job, you got to remember, how was the hedge there? What kept the hedge up? What kept the hedge up was the fact that Job offered blood on an altar continually. Are you listening? Because in that day, the hedge would have been the sacrificial blood. Can I prove it? Right out here on the Temple Mount years ago, centuries ago actually, when, when uh, the angel of God was coming to destroy Jerusalem and had the sword out, remember the story? And how David built an altar on the threshing floor of Arnon the Jebusite, which is right there near the dome, where the dome is, the rock under the dome. And it says, after he put the blood offering out, the angel put his sword away. Do you know that on, in Exodus chapter 12, when it, when it talks about the blood of the lamb at Passover, the blood of the lamb kept the destroyer out of the house. So in other words, in the Old Testament time, the sacrificial blood of an animal was the protective hedge that kept the enemy out. So watch this. In the early part, he's got blood. His children are protected. When God removes his hand, the first thing the devil takes is everything that has blood in it. So Job cannot run to the altar and put a blood sacrifice on the altar. Therefore, he cannot keep the hedge up. Are you listening? Because once God would have seen the sacrificial blood, God would have been required by, him, by his law and the duty of his righteousness to be moved by the sacrificial offering. So, you know, we talk about Job as a faith book. Oh, it certainly is, but it's more than that. It's a book that talks about the power of blood. Now, let's keep going here. All of a sudden, we read a verse, and I, I want to read this to you. Oh, wow. Okay? Uh, Job's... <laughs> Job, uh, verse 20, arose, rent his mantle, shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, naked I shall return hither. The Lord gaveth, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job, sin not, nor charge God foolishly. Now we know that it was Satan that took it, but he didn't know that at the time. Whoever wrote the book of Job tells us the story about it. Now, in Job chapter 2, you've got to watch this very carefully, there's a second wave of attack. And there was a day the sons of God came before the throne of God and Satan came with them. Here we go again. Now we don't know how much time, this is important, is between chapter 1 and chapter 2. It doesn't tell you that. It just says now we have a second way. So is it possible that here comes another assault on Job on Rosh Hashanah when the accuser of the brethren is standing before the throne of God? Now watch what happens here. Where you been, Satan, going to and fro on the earth, walking up and down it, you've been considered my servant Job. Sure, he says. But Satan says, skin for skin, all a man has he'll give for his life. Put now forth your hand now. Touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he's in thy hand. Now again, as long as the hand of God's on Job, Satan can't touch him. When God moves his hand, now Satan's hand can move. You see what I'm saying? Now watch what happens. Satan went forth from the, from the Lord, smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to his crown. He took a potsherd and began to scrape himself with all, sat down among the ashes. Now, in every translation, English translation of the Bible practically, here's what it says. His wife said to him, Dost thou retain thy integrity? Curse God and die. Now I'm going to give you a nugget. You go to any Hebrew Bible and you read what she actually said and here's what she said. Do you, do you, do you still retain your integrity? Bless God and die. The Hebrew word, we checked it out during this trip in a Hebrew Bible, is the word for bless and not the word for curse. There's a whole other Hebrew word for curse. So here's what she said. Just, just bless God and die. She's saying, thank him for what he's done, but now it's bad and it ain't going to get better for you, so you might as well die because you're as low as you get. Then Job answers her. Is that not good? Yeah. Because, it, you know, here's what he says. You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil? And all this Job didn't sin with his lip. lips. So here's what he's saying. You're saying to me, just bless God for what he's done and then die in this condition? He's saying, wait a minute, woman. I blessed him when it was good. I'll bless him when it's bad too. 
So she was trying to say bless him for the good, but don't bless him for what's going on now. That, that's the point. Just, just bless God and now die. So she's not looking into a future that's blessed. He is saying God's taken care of me in the past, and I'm just going to keep blessing him anyhow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Woo! Well, that's powerful. Now, here's the part that really got to me. Several years ago, I was preaching on the book of Job at a church, and for seven days and nights, he didn't say anything. He sat in this ash heap. He's got sores and sores all over his body. Then in verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 1, after this, open Job his mouth and cursed his day. Now look at verse 1, he curses his day. He talks about, he actually, if you keep reading this, he starts talking about, let him curse the day that I was born uh, because it didn't shut up the doors of my mother's womb. Why didn't I die from the womb? All of a sudden in chapter 3, God, Job is not cursing God. You know what he's doing? He's cursing himself. He's saying, I wish I would have never been born. I wish I would have died. It would have been better for me never to see the light of day. Now watch, watch this down here. All of a sudden, we come to the end of chapter 3, and Job just goes, For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. Now, I have read that for, year, for years, and I thought this is how it was preached when I was a young man. It was preached that, okay, Job confessed something wrong. Somewhere he said something he shouldn't say, and now he's saying, The thing which I feared with my confessions come upon me. And some people point back to the fact that he kept putting the blood offering on the altar because he was afraid his children had cursed God. Okay? Well, there's no record of his children cursing God, but all of a sudden he starts cursing his, his I wish I hadn't been born. It would have been better for me to die. And then he stops and says, Now the very thing which is cursing that I was afraid of has come unto me. In other words, I'm opening my stupid mouth right now and cursing myself, which is the very thing I didn't want my kids to do. You understand what I'm saying? So it really does not imply anywhere in the text that he lost his confession as far as that's concerned, but he's saying to himself, the very thing that I tried to protect from happening to my kids, I'm turning around opening my mouth and saying stupid stuff. So there is an element of that, but you got to understand, he never sinned against God. He never sinned with his mouth. It says it twice in the book of Job. All right, now, in the middle of the trial of losing everything you had, just imagine losing your home, 10 children, attending their funerals, having a, a sores breaking out in your body, body that are absolutely unbearable. All of a sudden, God has a way in the middle of the worst trial you go through of encouraging you. In, in Job, <laughs> Job chapter 23, he says, Behold, I go forward, but he's not there, and backward I cannot perceive him on the left hand where he doth work. He says, I'm living on the left hand of God. I'm not on the right hand. I'm not in the favor. I'm in the middle of the trial. There's the verse that has the word left hand on it, on the left hand of the Lord. But in the middle of the trial, let me read this verse to you. This verse says, Surely there's a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they refine it. Iron is taken out of the earth. Brass is molten out of the stones. He setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection, the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. Now, right in the middle of the trial, he says, surely there's a vein of silver. Here's the imagery he's giving you. He's in the earth in a dark mine. He can't see anything around him. But he says, if I keep digging in this darkness long enough, I'm going to hit a vein of silver. <laughs> now, most of the folks who watch Manifest, you know that silver is the metal that represents redemption. So when you hear about silver, it means redemption. So Job is like saying, I know it's dark where I am. I know I'm down here searching, but you cannot find gold on the surface of the earth. You have to dig to find gold. You've got to dig to find silver. You've got to dig to find precious stones. So he says, if I can hold on long enough, if I could just hold on long enough, I'm talking to somebody. If I can hold on long enough, I'm going to hit a vein of redemption. I'm going to hit a vein of silver. And then he goes on. I love this part down here. He says, because here's the key. There's a path that no fowl knows, where the vulture's eye has not seen, where the lion's whelp have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion have passed by it. So he's saying, there is a path. I don't know where it is, but I'm going to find it, where that roaring lion isn't going to get me. There's a path where that old vulture, you know, vultures can be compared to evil spirits. He's not going to get me. Now, if you go into the Bible, and we're going to go toward the, toward the end of the book of Job and show you two nuggets here. You know, Job's friends come along. He's got three friends that weren't real friends, actually. They just, they're telling him, you know, you're not, you got hidden sin in your life, and that's why God did it, and God's trying to bring you down because you've got pride in your life, and you had so much money you didn't know what to do with and did get. So Job has to answer all their crazy questions, all right? So finally, God himself gets tired of it. And God shows up in the whirlwind. And two things, these are the two strangest passages in the Bible when manifest is over. Don't, don't do this till it's done. 
Go to Job chapter 40 and 41, especially, well, 39, 40, and 41. There's a creature in verse uh, chapter 40 called Behemoth. Then there's something called Leviathan in chapter 41. This Leviathan is like a sea monster. The Bible even says it's a, dra it's a sea monster, a serpent with seven heads in Isaiah. And so you get to reading this thing, you get to looking at this, okay, and you're saying to yourself, what is God doing here describing this weird thing that's over the children of pride that no man can defeat it with natural weapons, all right? This is, a, Leviathan has always in the Bible been a picture of Lucifer or Satan, the fallen angel, right? Why does God come down and tell Job about Leviathan? Here's the reason why. Because the Bible said in the law of Moses, if the thief be found, he has to give back double. So, Job did not know who the thief was, but God did. Now, watch what happens after God reveals Leviathan in chapter 41. You come over here to 42, and he, God says, to Job's friends, I didn't like the way you talked to my man Job. So here's what you're going to do. <laughs> Woo! Take you seven bulls, seven rams, go to my servant Job, offer a burnt offering that my servant Job shall pray for you, and I'll accept him lest I deal with you after your folly. So Job has no blood. All his animals are stolen. But God then tells these three friends that's been hanging around him, you go get some animals. The ram and the bull were the high priest's offering in the temple, right?